Question now is it part one as amended stand part. All those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is it part two stand part. Debate on clauses 10 through to 48. Ah, the member's calling. I call the honourable member, Claire Curran. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Chair. Uh, I, in, in this part, there's quite a few, there's a number of points to be made, and uh, I'm certainly keen for the Minister, should he feel moved uh, to take a call, to, to explain to the House the, the rationale behind the SOP, um, the substantial SOP, which has um, appeared before us tonight, to give us... Uh, to, to, to provide the House with uh, some e e information that lies behind it, um, because I think that within, the, um, within this uh, lies uh, presumably uh, an important uh, rationale and an important um, explanation as to why we've moved uh, from uh, particularly for the overseas companies to, to the position that the Minister's taken. Uh, I'm, I'm also, uh, it, it's also important to say that this, and, and I think in, in, in looking at this bill, which has taken quite some time to go through the committee, it's been a really substantial piece of work uh, and there's been a lot of work done by the Commerce Select Committee on, on this and I think, uh, and I would like to acknowledge all the officials here tonight, the work that's been done and also the, um, the good solid work by the committee generally. It's actually 20 years old, this piece of legislation that's being replaced, and in its amendment to 80 other pieces of legislation. So it's quite a substantial piece of work, and it's taken quite some time um, to, to move through. It's part of a, 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 a number of pieces of legislation that have come before the Select Committee, uh, and on the reform and of uh, financial accountability uh, and around the importance of transparency and I know that my colleagues have um, talked quite a lot about both those uh, things tonight, transparency and accountability and I'll certainly be doing that myself but in, it, it's absolutely um, I, I think an acknowledgement that moving these things forward uh, in this modernised piece of legislation has, is really important and, uh, and should be acknowledged uh, for all the work that's gone into it and all the submissions that, and considerations that have gone into it. In talking about transparency and accountability though, I think it is really important that if we are being serious about these things, and I'm sure the Minister in the Chair would acknowledge that, that we, that we have to practice what we preach and that that, that hasn't always, uh, we're seeing time and time again examples where there are questions being raised about the transparency of particular contractual arrangements um, and the transparency of practices uh, uh, that are emerging. Chorus has been mentioned a number of times tonight. I do want to touch on that, obviously, because there's a piece of legislation that underpinned the, um, uh, the demerger of telecom that then turned into a contract for chorus that has been rolling out over the last couple of years. But since then, we've had a decision by the Commerce Commission, which the government didn't like, uh, which chorus didn't like, and now we, and then we've had a review uh, instigated by a minister, which has got questions around its legality that is now under judicial review, and, and subsequently we've got another inquiry into, announced uh, last week into the viability of chorus. Now, all of those things uh, have taken place as a result of a lack of transparency. A lack of transparency and, uh, and, and a lack and, and potential lack of disclosure of information that should have been made right from the very beginning, whether it's through the demerger process, the legislation process, or the contractual process. All of those things have resulted in a situation which is costing the taxpayers more money 
through reviews and inquiries, uh, and through uh, more officials' time, through legal bills, through uh, all kinds of procedures that uh, and and impacting on the viability of a, of a substantial infrastructure project. It all comes down to transparency, transparency and disclosure. And it would seem to me, Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, I call the honourable member Claire Curran. Um, that if we are going to be serious about the legislation that we're pushing through, that is about uh, requiring uh, accountability uh, by companies um, to, to their shareholders and through accountability to the taxpayers, that we have to practice what we preach. And this, uh, this particular uh, instance, which I know is embarrassing to the government, it's going to be an increasing embarrassment to the government. In fact, it could be described as a running sore for the government, uh, that this is going to go on and on. And ultimately, the shareholders are going to be demanding accountability from uh, their company, from Chorus, and the taxpayers are demanding accountability from the government around the disclosure or the lack of disclosure and uh, around that uh, accountability. So uh, I, I think what that all boils down to is that there's a disconnect. There's a disconnect between what uh, the government says it's doing and, uh, and some of the good work that's actually being done through uh, legislative processes and in, on this occasion the Minister and the Chair tonight is, um, is, is, has presented the, this uh, reasonably fine piece of legislation that's had a lot of cross-party work done on it uh, and agreement on it to the House but alongside that is a process that is running counter to it. And, and I think the people uh, listening to this tonight at 10 to 11 at night, if they are listening, have got the right to ask, how can that be? And why is that? And what is happening about it? And where's the accountability on it? Uh, so, um, Mr. Chair, um, I do want to raise one other matter in, uh, in this legislation uh, at Clause 45, I think it is, which is is around the um, meaning of the specified not-for-profit uh, profit entity, um, and I think it's Clause 45, but it's it's essentially around the threshold for determining a specified non-profit entity, um, which. I think is one of the examples in this bill where there was very good work done uh, and good listening and, um, and understanding of the impact of this legislation on the, on the not-for-profit sector and how it, it, it was important uh, to ensure the transparency and disclosure, um, but also it had to be acknowledged that uh, for the 2,000 to 3,000 churches around New Zealand which had operating expenses which um, uh, initially in the bill w meant that they would have to have a m much greater requirement for, um, uh, for operating um, uh, for disclosure and for uh, the, the compliance that, and, and who rely hugely on voluntary uh, treasurers and hugely on voluntary other voluntary people to meet requirements um, to, to of the bill as it as it stood originally, they would have had to have ended up employing professional people at great cost. And so, I think um, I'd like to co um, commend the committee for the advice that it took and for the conclusions that it came to around this, where the, the compliance um, dropped so that there was, um, it wasn't going to be such an onerous task for these, uh, for these organisations, these two to 3,000 churches around New Zealand. And I think that was a very responsible outcome. There is still compli uh, compliance requirements, and that's an, uh, extremely important. But I think that what, what it showed is that this bill, this particular bill, had the ability to be flexible and to recognise the importance of the um, not-for-profit sector and uh, in particular for the uh, impact that it would have on churches. So um, I would ask that the Minister um, did take a call in explaining the SOP 376 and the rationale behind it in terms 
of the um, overseas companies that carry on business in New Zealand and their requirement to file audited financial statements. Um, it was proposed that those obligations um, uh, that would, if would be that there would be obligations removed if the New Zealand business had both total assets of no more than 60 million and total revenue of no more than 30 million. Now these amounts have been changed in this bill through this rather large SOP um, to 20 million and 10 million respectively. And I'm um, curious and um, would like to know what the rationale is for that. And I just wonder if the minister would take a call. The question is that the Minister's amendments set out on clause 44 in SOP number 376 as set out on SOP number 393 be agreed to. As many of that opinion please say aye. aye. Contrary no. The ayes have it. The question now is that the Minister's amendments to part 2 as amended set out on SOP number 376 be agreed to. Those of that opinion please say aye. aye. To the contrary no. The ayes have it. The question now is that part two as amended stand part. Those in favour, please say aye. aye. To the contrary, no. The ayes have it. The question now is that part three debates on clauses 49 to 60 Mr. and including the schedules one and two stand part. Mr. I call the honourable member, Dr. David Clark. He's very Mr. Chair, um, this.